was the daughter of the third, the fourth generation of Tanoim, going back right, right after the that that period of those great sages began at at the close of the Anshe Knesses Hagdoyla. At the Anshe Hagdoyla began the Seder and the Tanoim. It was the fourth, it was the fourth generation of the Anshe of the of Tanoim. His greatness was uh, testified in the in the Chazal, uh, Mishle says that when Er Pesach, when they would ascend, the Klal Yisrael would ascend, gather uh, on the Beis Hamikdash to participate and be part of the the Korban Pesach preparation for Pesach. The the Korban Pesach sacrifice was such as the Kahal Goru, a tremendous throng that it couldn't accommodate all of those that uh, arrived at, in one in one city, in one shechite. So they had to close the door. They had to close the doors, have one, and then after that one was completed, the dismissed, people left, a second one came, and, and so forth, and to accommodate all of those that were coming to witness and be part of the, part of the Korn Pesach. So in Azor and in Ellis testifies the Chazal, uh, the, there was no one yeah, from that tremendous thousands and thousands that gathered in Azor and Ellis, the Misha Gol and El Bechachom of Minyan. There was nobody that was greater than Akali ben Ahalo in in Chachom in, uh, that matched his greatness. He said that his talk of Bishloishet Worm, a person should have in front of him, have present before him what is what he what he, what he was put on this world before for, and uh, and if you have constantly in front of him these three issues, that'll be a deterrent, a guarantee, an insurance policy. Policy, and I told them they are very, they won't do a sin. What they won't sin, they'll follow the straight path. What are the three? May I embossa where he came from, a humble beginning. Where he's headed for after he leaves this world. And who he has to give a din cheshbon for. Who has to give an accounting of everything that he did in his lifetime, the 70, 80, 90, 120 years of part of this world. Who he has to give an accounting before the the Melech Ma'at Farder Bonishlan, who have these in front of him, is returned. Giving an accounting is, uh, it has many, many faces to it. We had it in our community. <clears throat> we had the, the public school, and uh, the uh, principal of the public school, uh, she called me up one day, and she said that she has a number of children that their parents attend our synagogue, and they're well behaved. But she has one Jewish boy that he's so troublesome, whatever tactic, measure, positive, negative, uh, reward, punishment, it, it's, our, it's nothing works. Would I take the time to, uh, to speak to him? I told her, I'm flattered. I said, you're an educator your entire life. And you're turning to me, I'm flattered, if I can be any help. So she sent him over, and when he walks in, he looks like he had just made out his will. So I said to him, uh, young man, uh, what is your name? So he was stumbling 
for a for some kind of Jewish name, Moish, Moish, some Moish. I said that's fine, but tell me what do your friends call you? So he said, my friends call me Mark. I said, for me that's good enough. I said, Mark, on first glance, I, I can't imagine that anybody you have anybody only but good friends. How can you not help but like a young man like you? Oh, he said, Rabbi, you don't know. So he said, I'll tell you what I want you to do for me. You go home and write a composition on why it's important to respect your elders, behave in the classroom, and get good grades. I said, I stand up in hearts, and he was relieved. My goodness, he had no idea what I'm doing. He, he goes home, and ten days later, he comes back with a composition. And he writes like this here. It's important to respect your elders, uh, to behave in the classroom, and get good grades, because then your parents will be proud of you. It's important to respect your elders, behave in the classroom, and get good grades, because then you'll make a future for yourself. It's important to respect your elders and get good grades and behave in the classroom, because then you go to heaven. Otherwise, you go to Rabbi Fishbane. <laughs> so, that, so that was one one Ossivit in the Bechajman before Rabbi Fishman. There was the when that horrible Holocaust took place that took six million of Arkadoshim. So the Nazis gathered together, they gathered together several Jews on a work detail in Premishlov, town near Krakow that before they, they interned them in a concentration camp, they sent them out to collect all valuables, silver, gold, diamonds, from Jewish homes, and to turn it over to the Nazis. This one particular year, uh, he came into a Jewish home with a heavy heart. He saw there a Kiddush cup of Becher, that a father, a Zaydi, made Kitty Shabbos, Yontif, a Seder for a whole family, a few generations together, had handed over to Nazis, they should smash it and get for the ounces of silver. A Leichter, a candelabra, that a mother, a Bobby, stood there with tears in her eyes and she pleaded and prayed to the Almighty that he should give her, give them the pleasure, their children should grow up to be God fearing Torah scholars, handed over to the Nazis, that have smashed it and so on. This particular year came across a few diamonds. <coughs> and he wouldn't dare not hand these over to the Nazis if you were apprehended trying to hard for yourself. It was a death sentence. So he, he came across a few little diamonds that he was able to put in his ear and camouflage it with cotton. Then he was interned in the concentration camp and there, before you admit it, they had two lines. What, what the doctors would examine, and if you were fit for work, you went the line for life. I'm changed over kind of life it was in the country you can. But at least they didn't stuff out your life right then and there. Those that the doctors examined and were not fit for 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 work, they were in the line for death. This sheet with the diamonds in his ear, camouflaged with cotton, so he's he sees there's a year there that's missing two fingers, and the, the doc, Nazi doctor, like, just like you're writing down a prescription or a note for the shiksa, what to do in the house, so he writes down for, to death. This year, with the diamonds in his ears, from Chapla Shat Shitter, if he could, couldn't bear to see a man because he has two fingers missing, he should take his life. So he ran over to the doctor. He says, Herr Doctor, he says, what could I give you? that you should spare this man's life. Poof! I look at you, dirty Jew, there's nothing you can give me. He said, there must be something that you need. He said, well, I just got engaged, and I'm looking for a diamond for my bride. Standing behind him were Eden that knew he, that he had these diamonds in his ear, and they knew he had a few different quality diamonds, very rare, expensive diamonds, crystal clear, and cheaper ones. So they shushed it, they tried to whisper in his ear, he won't know the difference, give him the cheaper one. 
He says, to risk, he says, I to risk a Jewish life for a, for a quality of a diamond? Well, how can you do that? He gave him the, he took out, he said, I have it for you. He took out the best diamond and he handed it to Nazi. <coughs> the Nazi took it and the Nazi wrote this sheet for life. They both survived the war and they met him here in America. The Yid who rescued the donor, the one who took out the diamonds, he got married, he raised a mishpoche, a large mishpoche, and he was suffering poverty in the extreme. He didn't have what to feed his family. He struggled and struggled and struggled. The other gentleman went into the bakery business. And he was Matslia, who was very successful. He opened up one bakery, opened up a second bakery. When the first one who gave the diamonds to save the one's life married off his first daughter, the baker came along to show his gratitude. He brought him a cake for the husband, that takes the cake. That's all he needed was a cake. By the second daughter, he didn't even bother bringing a cake. Years passed, and that was the, the friendship. They never came across each other. No gratitude whatsoever. Like, like a wise man said, if you're looking for gratitude, look in the dictionary. So a kitchener, he was stricken with a terminal illness, the Nazman, the donor, and all of his dear ones were gathered around his bed. And he said to them, my dear ones, he said, you know, it always bothered me how the one that I saved his life He's here today, successful, and he never showed any gratitude for what I did for him. It really bothered me. I couldn't understand. <coughs> it was a skull cracker. How a person would be so hard, hard hearted not to show any gratitude. But I want to tell you something. I'll tell you the truth. I thank the Almighty that he never showed gratitude. As a result, he said, all my reward... But that deed is fully intact, because where I'm going now, where I'm going now, I can use every bit of that reward, every ounce, every penny of it.